you haven't noticed, Act has a narrative at the moment that's a third person. We mean by third person, uh, he, it, they, she. And we mean by first person, I, we. <coughs> and uh, interestingly enough, up until about chapter 15, it's all third person, and then suddenly it becomes it's all third person, and then suddenly it becomes first person plural, we, parts of it anyway. It's a kind of, it gets interstitched, I mean, some we and some they, which is really interesting. Something has happened uh, after about chapter 16 that the narration changes, and I think it's almost all scholars have agreed that what happens is that another document has made its appearance. And interestingly enough, that document resembles a lot of the pseudoclementines that we've been kept talking about because that's also in the uh, first person plural we. Why is, um, since you probably haven't read it, but in just from what we've heard, why would the pseudoclementines be in the first plur person plural we? Uh, because it says at the beginning of the homilies, uh, one of the versions of the Again, I keep repeating, uh, we're not reading them, but I do have uh, copies of them in that old folio if you want to have it. One of the versions of this was called the homilies. And said, well, how come? I don't know why. This is the name that stuck to it. So that's why we have uh, That's why we have this S here, because there are two versions. And um, one is, uh, uh, these are really two Hellenistic novellas or novels about the early church, particularly uh, confrontations between Peter and Simon Magus. But they're written in the name of this Clement, and the reason they're called pseudo, again, I repeat, is because the um, Orthodox Church, when it finally collected all its documents, often labeled what they considered heretical or non-orthodox documents false. So pseudo means false. Documents written in the false name of Clement. Clement is supposed to be the first pope of the early church, the successor to Peter. And Clement presents himself in the recognitions anyway as a follower of Peter who met Peter in Rome and goes back to Palestine or Jerusalem with Peter and there he meets the church, and strangely, although not from what we've said any longer, not strangely, led by James. And I think that's, uh, but the homilies has a, um, a introductory section that I also give you in that collection there, which are letters from um, Clement to um, Peter and Clement to James, I think, or whatever the letters are. I don't know if they're authentic, but they're as good as any letters we probably have in parts of the letter collection of the rest of the New Testament. And um, Clement is the author, and uh, the reason that these narratives are put in the we form is uh, they're supposed to be a report Clement is making to the Jerusalem church leadership about their travels overseas. So he's writing in terms of report. We did this, we did that, we did this, we did that, this happened to us, and so on and so forth while we were traveling. And uh, I think that's what the document in Acts that inter, uh, you know, interrupts um, the narrative uh, in, um, in, um, in uh, about chapter 16 is, a similar report, which again adds credence to the fact that we've been seeing all along here there are parallels to the pseudo-Clementines in Acts. Now, the only thing that is different is that the point of view is totally different. One is um, philo-Judaic, you want to call it that. The other is mm, uh, un-philo-Judaic. Uh, I, I warned people at the beginning of this class that religion is a subject that uh, you shouldn't follow if, you, uh, if it's so dear to you that you can't either evaluate it in, a, in an objective manner or uh, accept that there are some critical things others might have to say about it. And that goes for Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, or whatever. 
Christianity is our dominant religion in this country, so we're more sensitive on that score than others. We don't mind if people criticize Judaism or Islam or something, but we're very sensitive if they criticize the religion that we're familiar with, and that, that, uh, Christianity, which is fair enough because uh, people honor their ancestors and people honor the, their father and mother and they honor the solidarity of the tradition that they've been uh, bequeathed, and that's, uh, that's a normal thing to do. But in the university, unfortunately, we, uh, we, we do entertain um, criticism. And you know, I, if there's a passage that doesn't make any sense to me or I think is going to uh, um, embody something that is not Christian or not what the authors might have uh, wished to impart or what the founder of the religion might have wished to say, I think uh, we're, uh, we are uh, obliged to say that in an academic class. In a church class, you're not, although I think they should. Because in a church, um, the main thing is to keep the solidarity of the community. And you can't have the person being paid by the community saying things that could be construed as an attack on the documents. That would be, of course, uh, they would, um, they would, uh, they would um, fire us, get rid of such a person uh, because they're paying a salary. Well, again, I think in an academic world, if a person doesn't do this, he should not be, or should not, he, she should not be. Uh, Retain. You have to uh, question certain kinds of things. And in the 20, 21st century, sometimes I wonder which century we're in. I suppose we're in the 21st, but it still feels like the 20th to me. I don't know if you've gotten into the 21st, but I'm still in the 20th. Uh, I can't say the last century when it's five years ago. <laughs> it seems a little bit hard. This is the problem with using language. In the 20, 21st century, I call it that, the, the, the history we've witnessed. Holocausts, concentration camps, burning six million people. I mean, uh, particularly if someone comes out of that uh, tradition uh, and has some um, uh, uh, issues, th those now uh, have a right to be aired. And um, I don't think the predominant religion should not be strong enough to uh, entertain this, in other words. Uh, it is not the predominant religion that is uh, in danger here. It's people who have been put into gas chambers who, have, who are in, in danger. So uh, it seems to me every real Christian-minded person would want to find out if there's anything in the materials that they have, uh, uh, that they have inherited that could have encouraged or uh, been construed as encouraging this kind of thing. And that's all I've been pointing out. I think there are, and I think any real decent Christian person would certainly wish to deal with that issue unless they feel that they have any responsibility in this horrendous uh, thing that occurred in the last century or just 50 years ago. So I'm not going to stop speaking out. So anyone who doesn't like that can you know, take a, take a different course. I apologize to those people who feel that it isn't fair. I think it is fair, and I uh, honestly feel that uh, these things are a problem here in our country. Anyway, uh, Stephen's speech, I mean, whether you like it or not, we showed you where the origins of a lot of it come from. So uh, we can prove Stephen didn't make this speech. So you, any issue you have is with the writers, not with uh, me. And any issue you may have is with yourself on the issue of how you're going to deal with that. And then uh, the mistake Stephen makes is, uh, is the key to, uh, to um, showing uh, where that speech probably um, uh, was obtained. Uh, nobody had any, uh, any uh, tape recorder. So, so, you know, this is the kind of material in the beginning of Acts that you don't find in the end of Acts. When we get to the end of Acts, all the material will be down to earth, straightforward, reliable. I think, uh, you see now, Christian scholars basically avoid Acts. They don't want to deal with Acts because they know it's a really worrisome book and uh, a very tricky book at that. And therefore, most of them, I've met many who just dismiss it outright as total fabrication. But I don't consider it that. I don't consider it fabrication. I think that we can, underneath the surface, like gleaming pebbles, find the sources it's based on. And I told you, 
the key things I told you already, I believe, are there. The election to succeed Judas and the election to succeed Jesus. We know the election existed to succeed Jesus. We know who was elected. It is not an ax. Instead, we have a different election. I think material can be fairly drawn. Now we have the attack on Stephen. The pseudo-Clementines tell us there was an attack on James again. Who's the problem here? Oh, it is James is the problem. Why is James the problem? Because he represents a form of Christianity that we're going to see that Paul in his letters doesn't agree with. Paul, in fact, hates it. He calls these people in 2 Corinthians highest apostles, super apostles, Hebrews, and so on. He has scathing contempt for them. He calls them dishonest workmen disguising themselves as servants of Christ. I can show you where he, uh, he, he just says all kinds of things in 2 Corinthians that if you've ever read it, it are shocking. So we're doing Christian origins here, so it uh, seems to me it's, it behooves us to see. Um, he also worries about written credentials in 2 Corinthians, which he heaps abuse on because he doesn't think he needs uh, written credentials. Look at chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians. Um, people say that uh, this war, there's weapons of war he's talking about that he's involved in here, Islamic war. People say, truly Paul's letters are weighty, but the presence of his body is weak. Let no one think that such as we are through letters, we are absent. Uh, I, I, indeed, or something, line 12, we dare not rank ourselves among or compare ourselves with some. It's always the some is the key word. Some are the people from James, as we know in Galatians, who commend themselves, but measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves with themselves, they perceive not. So these people uh, also, we, uh, we find out, he claims, write their own recommendations. So he's got a real bone to pick with somebody. And it's some people within the church. 18, not he that commends himself is the one approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. These people have letters recommending them. And we find in the beginning of the Pseudo Clementines explains all this, that, that you were supposed to have letters from James in order to be able to preach. And it's quite clear uh, that he doesn't. Uh, if indeed, line 11.4, for instance, I'm going to be foolish, he says in 11.1. If someone preaches another Jesus than what we have preached, we heard already in Galatians, such a person is to be cursed. And you receive another spirit than the one we, you have received from us, and another gospel. And he obviously doesn't say what you should do with it, but it's obviously a negative statement. And then he shows what's on his mind. I am not behind the super apostles, the highest apostles, apostles of the surpassing degree, however you want to, uh, uh, want to uh, call that uh, in any way. The truth line uh, 10 is in me. I'm not just boasting and all the work I've done here in Achaia, I meaning Greece, where he met this Stephen is the first fruits of Achaia, remember? Uh, do not I love God? God knows. He's very sophisticated. Loving God is the piety commandment, the first of the two love commandments. Loving God is piety towards God. Loving your fellow man is righteousness towards your fellow man. Look, I love God so that I may be cut off, he talks about, because cutting off was what Essenes did to backsliders. For such ones are false apostles. There's what he uses the word uh, pseudo-apostles. Dishonest workmen, lying workmen, who transform themselves into apostles of Christ. So these super-apostles, it sounds like, are really liars and cheats and dishonest people. They make believe they're apostles of Christ. And they transform themselves. Uh, but is it any wonder that Satan can go around and make himself look like an angel of light? These people who make believe they're like people of light. And it's no great thing that his ser ser servants, meaning ser Satan's servants,
transform themselves into servants of righteousness. So these people are going around claiming to be servants of righteousness when they're in fact certain um, uh, Satan's servants. But their end shall be according to their works. And he's not very loving. He's full of jealousy, contentiousness, polemics. Now that's not an unfair thing to say. If you feel that's not fair, I mean, um, anyway, he's going to go on boasting. Well, look, I may be a fool, but I can't stop boasting you. And then he tells you, line 22, who these people are. Hebrews, are they? You see, you have to read, not for the spiritual benefit of this that you might get in a rich environment, but for um, the historical uh, aspects that we were interested in doing Christian origins. We're not here to preach. We're here to find out how these things develop. Hebrews are they? Well, he tells you right there who they are. These are super apostles who are Hebrews. And he doesn't like them. Uh, so am I. I am too. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? <laughs> I should have to be say this. Oh, uh, yeah, so am I. I am more. I am better than them. I'm not kidding you. This is how he speaks. But I'm sure no one ever reads this in a church to you. I excel them in labors and stripes beyond measure. I've been many times in prison and often in death. Five times I received from the Jews forty stripes. I was beaten with rods three times. I was the first man he mentions Jews. He doesn't call himself a Jew, notice. He called himself an Israel. So he always avoids calling himself a Jew. And I think the reason is that his Herodian background, if he is Herodian, uh, disqualifies himself from being Jewish of the tribe of Judah, therefore he sees himself as Benjamin and an Israel, even though there were no Israelites left at this time. But I think that was a claim the Herodians were making. Being in so this is what I'm trying to give you some insight here, for better or for worse. I was beaten with rods, I was shipwrecked three times, I passed night and day in the deep, I've been in travels, in dangers, in river, in dangers of robber, in dangers of countrymen, in dangers from heathen, in dangers in city, in dangers in desert, in danger in sea. Come on now, this is not a very controlled person, is it? If I started talking to you like that about my past history, you'd probably even want to put me in the loony bin, actually. Maybe it's all true. I've been in toil and hardship, out in toil and sleeping and fasting, cold, naked, and so on and so forth. And finally, 31, to sum it up, the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, He is blessed forever, knows that I lie not. And we already heard in Galatians that he says, probably you don't recall, I lie not. Several times he says he lies not. Well, whoever said he did lie? Often when a person is defensive on the issue of lying, someone is reacting to a criticism, like I may be, for instance, in this class, that uh, I'm lying or he's lying. You don't usually say I lie not. I'll give you another example where he says it. He says it here in Galatians. Uh, let me see if I can get it for you here. In Galatians, um, uh, where it talks about who he met in Jerusalem. First chapter. Uh, God, with his grace, line 15, separated me from in my mother's womb. That was, he was consecrated from his mother's womb like a Nazarite, the way our sources say James was. To reveal his son in me, his son was revealed in me, that I might preach the gospel about him to the people. But when I had this revelation, you see, <coughs> line 16, I, I didn't immediately talk it over with anyone who was flesh and blood. I don't talk to people of the church in Jerusalem. I didn't tell them anything. People were flesh and blood. I'm only talking to the Holy Spirit. He's got his own communication going with Jesus in heaven. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia for a time. And after that, I returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to make friends with Peter. He didn't know Peter before him. And I stayed there 15 days. Now this is the key section we have read before, but I did not see any other apostle except James, the brother of the Lord. Well now, the <coughs> statement he admits James is to be ranked among the apostles. Because in the way the statement reads, I didn't see any other apostle except James. That means James is an apostle. So he only mentions two apostles that he knows of. 
Peter and James. And he said he didn't meet anyone else. And when I write to you, behold, I do not lie. I am not a liar. That's the second one. And I give you in Romans a lot of others, and in some other letters, a lot of others. He is constantly saying, I do not lie. And that means someone is saying he does lie. At least that's what it means to me. Now I may be wrong. When someone is oversensitive, what I write, now that's a really important one. Then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, northern Syria, southern Asia Minor. And that's the reason I was not known by face in the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. They only had heard that he who had persecuted them in times past was now <coughs> preaching the gospel and the faith that he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God in me. So he says, they didn't know me. I wasn't known. No one knew what I looked like. I was unknown to the churches in Judea. I spent 15 days in Jerusalem. I knew nobody there. I only knew Peter and James. They're the only one who had met me. I, uh, I went abroad for 14 years, and after 14 years, I came back. Why are we reading this? And if anyone is concerned or upset, well, Christian origins, we have to do this. You may have to do it in a church, but we have to do it in this class. This doesn't agree with Acts at all. So something's wrong here. It doesn't agree with Acts, because we're going to find out that Paul preaches fearlessly in Jerusalem. And all the apostles gave praise that he was there and that the Jews were trying to kill him all of the time. That's what Acts is basically asserting. But Paul doesn't say that. And in fact, let's go over here back to uh, 2 Corinthians, which is where we were a moment ago. Um, so, in Damascus, I say, I do not lie. And then right after that, he picks up this part of his personal history, 32. In Damascus, the governor, Aretas, the king under Aretas, was guarding the city against me, wanting to arrest me. But that's not what Acts says. Acts doesn't say the governor, Aretas, is, it was an Arab king who came from Petra, who had taken over Damascus at this time, who, remember, fought the war uh, against uh, Herod the Tetrarch, who had killed John the Baptist because uh, Herod the Tetrarch had divorced him and his Aretas' daughter. So that makes it sound like, in fact, Paul is on Herod the Tetrarch's side. And Aretas wants to arrest him because he's against Herod the Tetrarch. That is, he, Aretas, is against Herod the Tetrarch. It has nothing to do with Jews at all. And Later on in Acts, we're going to hear that Herod the Tetrarch has a foster brother who is one of Paul's colleagues in the church in Antioch. So there's some connections here. Uh, that would imply that Paul was on the side of the people involved in the death of John the Baptist. He says he persecuted early Christians. He said he persecuted some unto death. Is John the Baptist one of them? In my view, there is some indication that he might have been. You know, we have some really serious issues here if you're concerned about the church in Palestine and what happened and why Acts is presented in the way it is and why certain things are avoided in Acts. If I was writing Acts, I'd avoid mention of these things too. So you say, well, you have the right to mention them. Well, yes, we do because it's the 20th century, 21st century, and it's time that people came to grips with this without being burned at the stake. So we can get a real good history and that we can make Christianity perhaps more righteous if there is a problem of righteousness. Some people don't like uh, the Christian right. Some people don't like uh, all these, uh, you know, um, uh, all this intolerance, perhaps. I mean, I don't have a problem with evangelicals because I think they have a good heart and that they mean well, and some of them, they're on the right side of a lot of issues. Uh, maybe they're on the wrong side of some issues. So if we can work out this righteousness thing, maybe we can even get things moving all together in a decent way. But until you sort these things out, I don't think it's going to be easy to get people on the same wavelength. So it, the problem might be in the documents themselves. So anyone who says, oh, we shouldn't treat the documents like this, are not really uh, um, being fair in a way that ooh, the, the criticism is that maybe meant constructively, not destructively. We can get the righteousness thing back into things. Maybe we can, um, you know, 
sort out some of these issues. Anyway, let's look here. He doesn't lie. I have to say a last thing. This is on the Dead Sea Scrolls to us. But the Dead Sea Scrolls, as they've uh, unfurled, and we found them only since 1948 along the Dead Sea, which is why they're called Dead Sea Scrolls, have several characters. Two of the most prominent characters are the righteous teacher or the teacher of righteousness. Now, the teacher of righteousness, every time he's spoken of in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's usually in a text commenting on a biblical passage. And the biblical passage, if you look at the Hebrew underlying the text, is always the word tzaddik, righteous. So whenever the text says, and the tzaddik, so and so and so and so, whether it's in Psalms 37 or Habakkuk, the prophet, or someone else, it's always, the underlying text is always tzaddik. Well, we have already heard in our early Christian literature material from Eusebius that James was known as the tzaddik. That's what he was called. So, whenever the scrolls come upon the word, this is what made me think James and the righteous teacher had a lot in common. And that's the key thing that teaching these classes 25 years ago put me on the track of making comparisons between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the early Christian community in Palestine. That one point. In any event, if you look at these materials in the scrolls, the, the tzaddik in the scrolls is always the teacher of righteousness, which is a play on tzaddik. Tzaddik is righteous one. Tzaddik, righteousness, is righteousness. And the two are based on the same root. Here we call ZDK, meaning righteousness. Justification is another word in Hebrew based on the same root. It just means to make someone righteous. We say justification in English, for lack of a better word. And Zadok, sons of Zadok, is just a name based on the ZDK. So there's a lot of, uh, of wordplay in Hebrew that if you don't know the language, you can't catch. Anyway, the teacher of righteousness obviously has a doctrine of righteousness. That's what he has, a doctrine of righteousness. By the way, Melchizedek is another word based on the same root, Zedek, righteousness, king of righteousness, that means. So, he has a doctrine of righteousness. Now, his opponent in the scrolls is called the liar. And he's not someone outside the movement, he's someone inside the movement who denies the law. So this is what made me see the parallel with the James-Paul matter. And I mean by the law, the Mosaic law, the Torah, if you like. Not that I follow the law, which I don't. I'm a big shrimp, uh, lobster, uh, eater. I do not separate anything out. I'm not an observer of the law. So I don't need to, I'm not here to advocate the law. I'm only here to advocate fair history. So, you find in <laughs> this parable, that you have a person in the scrolls called the righteous teacher who, who wants the law observed, who wants to separate holy from uh, uh, profane, who thinks the holy things should be set up according to the precise, precise specifications, that's in the Damascus document. We even have this idea of Damascus in, in the um, scrolls. Then we have his ideological adversary called by many names, primarily the man of lying or the liar, the spouter of lying, or the comedian joker. They have several names, but it's quite clear that what the comedian joker does is pour out the waters of lying, as it said in the Damascus stuff. And he pours it out on the community. And what the waters of lying are is to abolish the pathways of righteousness, which the ancestors, the first set down as their inheritance. And as you go through the language of the scrolls, you realize that what they're talking about is he abolishes the law of Moses. So the righteous teacher and the liar argue over the law of Moses and its effect. Well, that's what you're getting in Paul's letters. That's why I, in fact, drew this correspondence. Now, I would never have suspected any of these connections before teaching these classes or before the scrolls were found. But after the scrolls are found and we get all this new information that's unadulterated Palestinian material 
that didn't go through the editorial processes of the Roman Empire or even of rabbinic Judaism, but was stuck in caves, and they're moldered and you know decayed for two thousand years until someone stumbled on them and brought them out again. That's the situation that we're faced with. The only uh, uh, negative to this parallel is the way people have dated the scrolls 100 or 200 years, some people like to say before Christ. I don't think that that dating is accurate any more than I think the dating of the Holy Shroud, uh, with all of the arguments. They've had a lot of material since uh, the Da Vinci Code and so on on the Holy Shroud. I think the Holy Shroud is ancient. I don't think the carbon dating is accurate on the, on the Holy Shroud. Because I think we have evidence of it even in the Agbaris story here, where Agbaris wants an image, if you recall, and Eusebius sent to him from Jerusalem, and they send him to him. And Agbaris is the king in Edessa, and Edessa is where the shroud was known to have come from. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm not saying, I don't say the shroud says that someone was resurrected. I don't know what the meaning of the image on the shroud is, but I don't think that the carbon testing is accurate. I may be wrong there. I don't know. My intuition tells me that. It, it looks pretty ancient, uh, but uh, you know it could be wrong. It certainly isn't a painting, and it certainly isn't someone something someone faked in the uh, you know like Da Vinci or somebody. Uh, it's something uh, more uh, odd. It's the first photograph basically that's been preserved in some odd way. It's a photographic negative, but it's not even exactly a negative because it doesn't have the you know the kind of uh, thing that you would. Uh, thing happened in the sense that something something odd about it. Anyway, I don't want to go into all of that. But what I'm trying to say is that the problem in Dead Sea Scroll dating is only 100, 200 years. The problem about the Holy Shroud is about 1,200 years problem in the in the in the carbon dating vis-a-vis -vis what people think about with the shroud. So I I don't want to comment on the shroud, but where the scrolls are, the carbon dating is not a big obstacle even though people think it is. And uh, it's about, we're talking about 100 years, and the margin of, of error in carbon dating is a couple hundred years anyway. So, I mean, that's not a big, that's not a big issue. So the problem with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have just the situation we have here. Why am I uh, emphasizing it? Because of this sensitivity to lie. The scrolls are called, calling someone a liar. Someone who's very important in ideological terms <coughs> within the community. Now the scrolls are considered to be Essene. I think they are Essene. So the righteous teacher is the leader of the Essene movement. Well then the liar is someone who left the Essene movement. And to my mind, he has all the characteristics of a Paul. So therefore, the pseudo-Clementine literature is very interesting literature in that it describes a pro-Essene situation where people like Peter are not presented as Paulinists, but are presented as Essenes, bathing daily, vegetarian. We don't get the picture of Peter here as a vegetarian. Do you see any indication that Peter's a vegetarian here? <laughs> no. Well, so where do the pseudo-Clementines get that Peter's a vegetarian? From the Essene James sort of uh, current of, of the literature. So they're really very interesting material there. Anyway, I'm interested in the lying idea here. And he says here, I, I do not lie. I'll give you one other indication before I go back to Acts. Uh, and this is uh, trying to uh, look at Galatians again. By the way, if you want to go through Romans and see all the times Paul says he doesn't lie, and all the times he says that he's, uh, you know, that um, he's abolishing the, the law of Moses and things, I mean, you, 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 you could count quite a few of those. And uh, so, you know, any of these main letters are full of this kind of material. What's the problem? These kind of materials are too sophisticated, too difficult for most people to read. Most people want to go into a church, hear a sermon, sing hymns, and get communion or something like that, and get on with their daily life. They don't get in there and start arguing over what Paul said in paragraph two of, you know, Good Galatians or Corinthians or Romans. That's, that's like, that's like pulling teeth. But we can do it in a class like this because we're not dealing with the sacraments and spiritual salvation. We're dealing with intellectual um, uh, discussion. And so there what for we can go into Galatians. So look, go over to Galatians, something no one ever looks at. Look at here in chapter 4 when he's really all worked up. Look at, I can go back, I love this stuff in 4-7. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. 
see, a slave is always slave to, to the law, is always what he means. Now you're a son of God, you see, an heir of God through Christ. So we have numerous sons here. But then not knowing God, you were a slave to those who by nature are not gods, the leadership of the Jerusalem church. But now that you have been known to God, he loves this rhetorical message, not known, known, known. In Greek poetry, it's called strophe, antistrophe, and epoch. In philosophical analysis, it's called uh, uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. This is a rhetorical method he uses, and I've only discovered it now and latterly when I'm trying to figure out he does it all the time. And he shows he's completely trained in Greek, what we call sophist sophical, sophistry, rhetorical uh, argumentation stuff. And here it is, is, you know, he picks up the knowing and the slave and then goes back on it. You were not know, you have known God, but you have been known by God, and so on and so forth. He does it all the, all the time. And that makes people's heads spin. But you, the reason it makes your head spin is you have never been trained like he has in the Greek style of rhetoric. And um, once you know his training, then you can recognize it when he does it. But the average person, even today, 2,000 years later, is like, uh, just like mulled over by this because it's so um, impressive. But look at then you have been known by God, line nine. How can you turn again to the weak and beggarly principles to which you again desire to be enslaved? Meaning that that's how he talks about the law of Moses. That's what he's talking about there. He calls them the weak and beggarly principles. And the reason he calls them beggarly is because he knows the group that most adhered to the law in his time were the poor, the Ebionites, the followers of James. And he's making a pun on poor. Now, how would an average prisoner know that? And why would anyone be antagonistic to me for pointing it out? That would only deepen people's knowledge, not upset anybody. We want to know those things. If, if, if Paul is saying something that Jesus didn't say, or is speaking in Jesus' name, is anything that Jesus didn't want to say, then I would want to know it if I were a follower of Jesus. And I know that Jesus would want me to know it. So I don't see there's a problem here. And uh, James is certainly the closest one to Jesus. So if he's attacking Jesus' own brother, well, unless Jesus' own brother is a complete nobody and has it all wrong, then I want to know that. And who is he? He's a Roman citizen who killed people? Why? Who, where does he get off attacking anybody? So that's only the question you have to ask. But here he's very, he's very clever in his attack. He calls him the weak and beggarly principles. Let me see if I can look at the Greek here on this one. Uh, let me see. The weekend, beggarly, poor, poor principles that you're enslaved to. We hear about the slavery later on in this letter when he talks about Hagar, that the Jews are the sons of the slave woman because they follow the covenant of Sinai. So we know what he means by slavery. And we're the free because we're the children of Sarah. Well, it's totally the opposite, of course, of their, their understanding of history. And the reason is that we are the sons of God, the heirs to God through Christ Jesus. Okay, you keep the days, months, and times, that is all the seasons and the things that the law sets, and this, he, con he, he condemns this. Now if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls loves the days, months, and times, and calls them the flags of God's beautiful spirit. <laughs> so the scrolls are totally against this mindset. That's, a, that, that's basically what I'm attempting to, uh, to uh, tell you, that we have a, a, a totally parallel mindset, the very opposite of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm afraid I have, been, I have labored in vain regarding you. You know, I've been working so hard to show you the real meaning of Christ, and you guys keep forgetting it or are lured away by other people who don't have the message correct. And then finally he said, Look, I tell you, if it were possible, I'm 15, I would have plucked out your eyes and given them, you would have given them to me. And uh, now you despise me and spit on me and stuff like that. His communities have turned against him. And 16, have I then your enemy become by speaking truth to you? Ah, there we are. We heard that 
there was an enemy who attacked James on the Temple Mount, and that Paul, according to the Ebionites, was known as the enemy. Here he says, he's aware of that. Have I your enemy become? He knows that people are calling him the enemy. Now, that doesn't mean he is the enemy. I'm just saying that he's aware of this conflict. And who are the people who are calling him the enemy? And how has he become the enemy? Ah, because he tells the truth. He doesn't lie. They say he's lying, therefore he's the enemy. That connects up the two terminologies. The lying, founder of lying terminology, with the enemy terminology. Ah, uh, but here he says, <laughs> I don't lie, I tell the truth. That's why they think I'm your enemy. And who are these people? They are eager after you. But if you look at the Greek, it's zelo, it's zelosis. In other words, uh, zeloson, zelotes. They are zealots. They are zealots for the law. Now in Acts 21, we're going to hear that most of James's uh, followers are zelosis or zelotes <coughs> for the law, zealots for the law. <coughs> so we're going to, uh, it's quite, they are zealous after you, but not in the right way. They desire to uh, keep you, let me see, let me read you the actual, uh, they are zealous after you, but not correctly. They are zealous to exclude, uh, uh, so that you may be zealous after them. But this is not right. It's better to be zealous in the right thing at all times. So he's using the word zealot, I think, at least three, if not four times in two lines. Right after the fact of his having uh, said that these people are calling me your enemy. So to my mind, who he's attacking here are zealots for the, for the law. I may be wrong, but that's, to my mind, what's implied here. Now, the average parishioner or believer is not going to be able to sit down and deal with these matters. But in a class, we can. Okay. Uh, but it's, uh, look, and, and not only when I'm present, you are my little children. Tell me, tell me, 21. <coughs> you want to be under the law? So he says it. He brings the law in right there. So we know the people who are doing this are zealots for the law. They're the ones calling him the enemy. They're the ones calling him the, the liar because he wants to abolish the law. And that's what we get in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I'm not saying that proves anything, but that's a certain interesting, strong parable. Now listen to what he again goes on to that thing we read before. But let's read it again because it is worthwhile reading. So we don't have to go back to it a hundred times. So that people don't think that I'm just talking out of nonsense here. Uh, you want to go back and be under the law? Uh, do you not hear the law? I'm going to read you from the law. And he means by the law now the first five books of Moses. But he's playing fast and loose because that's the law is not the first five books of Moses as such. That's called the Torah. But the law, the law, law is in it, not the allegories in it. So he immediately doesn't go to what it says, but to the allegories. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one the slave woman and one the free woman. You read the Bible, Hagar and Sarah. Hagar's son was the firstborn. What was his name? And who are the descendants of Ishmael? Muslims consider themselves to be the descendants of Ishmael, and they all go around saying we're all sons of Ishmael, and that's why we're better than the Jews and Christians because we were the firstborn, and so on and so forth. And the Jews consider themselves to be, or the Hebrews and the Jews, children of Sarah, right? Ah, but that's not what Paul said because he's not interested in the actual story. He wants the allegorical meaning. That is Philo of Alexandria's allegorical interpretation of scripture that we heard about in Eusebius. Now, I don't think this is unfair material to bring to your attention. In fact, I think it's helpful. So, that's why I teach it. Otherwise, I have nothing to teach. We just read the book and that's it. You know, let's go to Sunday school. He had two sons, one the slave, and that's the key, the slave. The slave means, as we'll see, slavery to the law. But he was born out of the slave woman, and was born after the flesh. And he, out of the free woman, was born after the spirit or the promise. Now, we're the people born out of the spirit or the promise. So we are the children of Sarah, and the Jews are the children of Hagar. But that's just the opposite of what the Jews are claiming in their genealogies. So what's he doing? He's allegorizing everything. Well, this has nothing to do with the law. He says, I'll tell you what, what the law says. Well, you see, this is not what the law says. 
this is just an allegorization of the story in the book, first five books of uh, Moses. Okay. Uh, which things are allegorized, as he says? And it's even in the Greek. Allegu, allegurimena. That's what it says in the Greek. It's the same word in, in, in the Greek. Some <coughs> things are allegories or allegorized. He gets that from Philo. For these are, there are two covenants. Now I'm going to explain to you what the whole thing is. Two covenants. One Mount Sinai. Well, we know what Mount Sinai is, don't we? That's the Mosaic covenant. Ah, but you see, since Mount Sinai, as he knows very well, is in Sinai, and this brings forth what? Slavery. Now we know the whole thing right here. Slavery is the Mosaic covenant. Slavery to the law. He wants to do what? I'm not saying he's wrong. I, 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 I'm free of the law. I'm not arguing with his philosophical uh, intent. I'm just arguing with the way he does it. And, and showing you why some people would be offended the way other people might be offended by me. The people in his own time would be horrified by what he's saying here. Only people overseas wouldn't be horrified by this. In Palestine, you see, if someone said this in Palestine, I think it's no wonder people want to kill him. It's like me going to Mecca <laughs> and saying that you people are all sons of the devil. <laughs> and so on. Well, of course, I get my throat slit in five minutes down there. So, you know, see, the scripture is showing Jesus as saying these things and therefore being executed by the Romans. I, it doesn't make any sense. But the point is, I don't think Jesus ever said these things. This is Paul's. Christianity. And that's why Paul runs into the kind of troubles in synagogues and places that James and others did not. Because James and I believe Jesus, because I think James is the closest one to Jesus, and therefore he knew him better than this latter day, uh, you know, um, to my mind, upstart who never met Jesus, never knew him, never knew what he preached, never knew anything, and only has visions. People have visions that worry me personally, but they may not worry other people, but they worry me. So that's why I feel justified in bringing this to your attention. For Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And that answers to the present Jerusalem where the Jews are. The Jews are really Hagar. And she is the slave person with her children. But we're in the Jerusalem above, which is free, and the mother of us all. And therefore he quotes some more scripture. Uh, rejoice, cry out, uh, this is from Isaiah, and you'd have to see what the actual context is in Isaiah. I wouldn't even want to try to start that one up here. Isaiah 54.1, if you want to start looking, it's right near where uh, the suffering uh, servant material is in 53. But brothers, we like Isaac, are the children of the promise. But as then he has been according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to so since we know that that this is enough. Esau now no. Ishmael persecuting Isaac. I don't think Esau persecuted uh, Ishmael persecuted Isaac. Esau persecuted Jacob, as I recall. But I don't think Ishmael did anything to Isaac, as I recall. Oh, that man when they were playing together, maybe there were some problems when they were playing and Sarah got upset when they were little kids playing out of the tent. You remember the whole thing when Abraham banishes uh, uh, Hagar and Ishmael because Sarah's jealous of the fact that uh, they're playing together? I don't know. <laughs> but as Abraham shows himself to be totally soft-minded listening to that kind of uh, complaint there. But anyway, never mind. You may know. But uh, even this is a stretch here. They say, well, no one argues with Paul. Well, I argue with every text that's Noel will, will, will agree. I argue with every text I read, whether it's in uh, uh, something to do with um, uh, Malcolm X or uh, whatever it is uh, in our, my other class or this one. What does scripture say? Throw out the slave woman. And the son of the slave woman shall not in any way inherit. So then, brothers, we are not the children of the slave woman. We're the free woman. Well, that is the most astonishing gymnastics with rhetorical ideas that you can imagine. Out of somehow he's gotten that the text in the scripture that has to do with, uh, I don't even know, know what text that is, um, throughout the slave woman or something like that, 
has to do with throwing out people who observe the law of, of Moses. And since we are, do not observe the law of Moses, we are not thrown out. <laughs> All he's basically saying is that he was thrown out of the Essene movement, I believe, because he didn't observe the law of Moses, and they did. And he's just reversing their rejection of him to a rejection of them. Now, I don't know if that makes any sense. Anyway, so you got to admit those passages are pregnant with meaning. Let's go back finally to Galatians. Uh, to, uh, uh, I mean, Paul is really just a fantastic person to uh, read. And until you read him, you can't even get a handle on some of this other stuff. So I hope you will read Galatians, Corinthians 1 and 2 before the end of the class. Because I can't read them all to you, but you can't really read Acts without reading those in conjunction to some extent. And you read those three letters. Romans is a little more, uh, you know, uh, drawn out. So uh, it's enough to read Corinthians 1 and 2 and Galatians to get a handle on where Paul's coming from. Anyway, here's the next thing. So back to Corinthians 2 with the bragging about why he's not behind the super apostles who are Hebrews in any way. And they're also false apostles and apostles disguising themselves as servants of righteousness when in fact they're servants of Satan. Um, in Damascus, line 32 of chapter 11 of Corinthians 2, back to our Damascus situation of the Galatians, the Aretas was guarding the city, and I was lowered out through the window in a basket and escaped his escape arrest. So nothing about the Jews wanting to kill Paul, nothing about the Jews angry at Paul in, in Damascus, only the uh, Arab uh, uh, governor who represented the Arab king Aretas who had recently conquered the place wanted to get Paul for some reason and he escaped. Now, Acts will have <coughs> Paul coming down oh, with you so you know what we're talking about. Acts will have Paul here after he gets his vision on the road to Damascus. Uh, let's see. Um, should be around Acts 9. But Saul increased, line 22. Well, this is in Jerusalem, I think. And confounded, oh no, and, and more in strength, and confounded, upset uh, the Jews who lived in Damascus because he was proving that Jesus was the Christ. Now man, there were many, uh, at past, many days past, the Jews plotted to kill him. Well, that's the story of the Gospels about Jesus. And the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plan became known to Saul, and he knew that they were watching the gates day and night so they might kill him. The Jews, that is. But taking him by night, the disciples let him down the wall, lowering him in a basket. Well, you have two choices here. Either this is wrong, or Paul escaped twice down the walls of Damascus in a basket. Frankly, I can't imagine that he twice escaped down the walls of Damascus in a basket. So what this shows us is the mindset of the people writing this document that we've already observed how they are slightly moving the, the presentation over into this other not very kind area. I'm going to read you next time Eusebius' view of how the Jews were repaid by having to eat their own children in Jerusalem in the passages he quotes from Josephus that I didn't have a chance to read to you before where he actually revels in the fact that hundreds of thousands are killed and they eat their own children and other things because they're starving. But they deserved all of this as far as he's concerned. So, the authors, like Eusebius, it's not surprising Eusebius feels that three centuries later because the authors have already done this. They've moved this over. Paul has his own problems, but he doesn't go this far. They've already pushed it over further. And what comes right after that? He escapes from Jerusalem, line 26 now, and after Saul had come to Jerusalem, having escaped, he joined himself to the disciples. They were upset and frightened of him, believing that he was, uh, didn't, 
didn't believe that he was a disciple because they knew that he had persecuted the church previously. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, plural, and told them how he had seen the Lord and that he had spoke to him and how he had been spoken bodily in Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so, line 28, he was with them, that is, the apostles and the disciples, or both, coming and going in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, we just read Galatians that said just the opposite. I mean, am I wrong here, or am I nuts? I mean, is it, is, is it true? Did, is this what Galatians said? And how can you reconcile these things? So, right after Acts says the one thing that contradicts 2 Corinthians, it says the next thing that contradicts Galatians. What am I trying to say? Not that something didn't go on here and things weren't happening, only that we can see the writing method of Acts authors at this point. And it's consistent all the way through up to this, and it will go on being this way till Acts 15. I do apologize, we're only in Acts 9 here. We have about six more chapters of this to go, when things will settle down and get a little more straightforward. But you see, at this point, we can see that Acts is not agreeing with Paul's own testimony. So you as a believer, or as a scholar, whichever you prefer to see yourself as, have to decide, where do you stand? Are you on the side of Acts, or are you on the side of Paul's all letters? Now, most of us in the field, and I think that is a fair statement, particularly myself, obviously, but about everybody else I have ever met, where there's a contradiction, except for people who are preaching and are involved in the faith side of things, where there's a contradiction between Paul's first-person testimony in his letters and Acts' third-person narrative in this book here, where they don't agree, Paul's letters are the primary source and are to be preferred over Acts, which is a secondary source. <coughs> now, uh, you want to, uh, you, you, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where the question might be on that. You don't have to agree with that, but it makes, to my mind, sense. The first person, if we agree that Paul's letters are authentic, and some of them are, like Galatians and Corinthians 1 and 2, are generally agreed by almost everyone to be a true representation of what he said. And if there's a contradiction, then those letters are to be preferred. I, I agree with that point. Now, that may not be true, and you'll have to evaluate that. That's your decision on that. But therefore, this is all to be rejected here. That's accurate. Maybe something was going on here, but oh, similar to this, but not like this. So uh, let me just finish uh, 2 Corinthians. So uh, he also goes on that um, after being lowered down in a basket, look, I knew a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in body or soul, I do not know, and he was caught away to the third heaven, and whether in body or soul, I do not know, and he was caught up to paradise and where he heard unspeakable words about which a man was not allowed to speak. That's a really interesting section there in 2 Corinthians. It's about someone who's doing mystical journeying. Madonna would like that. That's exactly what Jewish Kabbalah is all about. And in fact, being caught up to heaven and uh, the different degrees of heaven, it's called Hekalot mysticism, uh, is very prominent in uh, Kabbalah, which is the mystic tradition. And uh, it's called Hekalot mysticism, which is the mysticism of heavenly ascents. Ascents mysticism, that's what we have here. The other is called Merkava mysticism, which is the mysticism of Ezekiel's chariot, Merkava in Hebrew being the chariot. There's two kinds of Kabbalah, Hechalot, which is ascents, and uh, chariot, which is uh, based on the chariot vision of Ezekiel. Uh, I'm not a big mystic man, and I'm not uh, one who goes according to this stuff, not that it matters, but uh, this is definitely hello mysticism here. But the interesting thing is the, is the number 14. You see the 14? Once before in his letters, he speaks about 14 years. Where was that? I just read it to you. He was not, he, 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 was, he left Jerusalem, and he didn't come back for 14 years. 
and that he comes back to lay the gospel as he taught it among the non-Jewish peoples before James, Kephas, and John. Or James, Peter, and John, if you think Kephas is Peter. And for fear, as he said, that the course I was running or had been run would not be accepted or so on. And they put their hand out to me and they said that he was to go to the non-Jews and they would continue going to the Jews. That's all in Galatians 2. So the 14 years is there too. Now that may just be coincidence, but if it isn't, then to my mind, the person who's involved in this mysticism is also James. That James is involved in this sort of mystic journeying. And we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls mystic texts like this about this kind of journeying. One of the texts is called the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, about visiting the, how the gods in heaven go about the sacrifices like the gods on earth and the different heavens and so on. It's an extremely mystic text, like Kabbalah, and uh, to my mind, uh, this kind of mysticism was being uh, practiced uh, uh, among the Dead Sea Scroll community to some extent as well. I can't go any deeper into that. I just t tell you that that is true. Let's finish this up. Okay, well, look, I, I, I don't like to boast about myself, line five. I, I'm not going to boast about my weaknesses. Look, look, um, I, I, I don't want to be a fool by boasting too much. So I might not be made proud by these heavenly visages and so on and so forth and uh, that these other people boast in. So he's criticizing that and so on and so forth. Um, and I don't know if there's any more boasting here that he talks about, but uh, uh, I think that, let's see. So the super apostles, whom he mentions about three or four times here, or at least two times anyway, are these Hebrew apostles, uh, who he also calls servants of righteousness, but really servants of the devil disguising themselves like that. Let's go back here now to how we got off on this tack. Uh, the Stephen episode, where we're trying to decide what happened with Stephen and was there Stephen and so on and so forth. Well, anyway, they threw him out of the city in line 58 of chapter 7, and the witnesses laid their clothes, as we've already seen, at a young man called Saul. And then Stephen bowing down and cried out with a loud voice, do not lay this sin on him. And we basically have the same thing in the James stoning scenario. So we have a lot of points of contact between this and this James stoning scenario. And as I told you in the Pseudo-Clementines, at this point there, there is an attack led by the enemy Paul, or Saul, on the leadership of the Jerusalem church on the steps of the temple when they're debating with the temple authorities and about the time that they're about to win the debates. So you take all those three things together. Acts, the stoning of James, four things. Acts, the stoning of James, the stoning of Stephen, the attack on, on um, James in the, in the pseudo-clemens and decide where you think the truth lies at this moment. And that's, I'll leave it to you. And more than that, Stephen and Josephus being the emperor's servant, beaten by Jews after the centurion exposes himself on the wall at Passover time and beaten outside the walls of Jerusalem, and then, of course, Stephen being Paul's first fruits in Achaia, Corinth, and so on. Um, I've tried to put all that material together and come with the conclusions I came with in the James book. You'll make your own conclusions. But now, chapter 8, Acts changes gears, and basically we're going to follow Paul from now on. We're going to have a, a one slight interruption in this when Peter... Uh, then when Peter starts his confrontations with, guess who? Simon Magus. Once again, linking up with the Pseudo-Clementines. The Pseudo-Clementines, that's all it's about, Peter's confrontations with Simon Magus. In Acts, it's one section of, but you see, we're following basically the same, uh, the same layout. It's one section of chapter 8. But after chapter 8, when we get into something like chapter 9, I think, in fact, from that moment... Um, no, we have another we have another bit about Peter here in uh, chapter 10 when at the end of chapter 9 beginning of chapter 10 we'll get to it uh, 
but after most of, most of the rest of the Acts is, is about Paul from chapter 7, end of chapter 7. Anyway, they buried Stephen and everyone scattered. Chapter 8, that's the presentation. Everyone, but who? Well, it doesn't look like the leadership's scattered. So you have to ask, how come these people are having trouble and the leadership isn't? How come James and the others are able to stay in Jerusalem continually for the next 20 years and not have any problems where other people are pictured as having problems? I think I've answered that question in the only way I can answer it, that it's a matter of this problem of the law. Well, line three, Saul was ravaging the church. Entering houses, dragging out people, delivering them up to prison. Uh, the question you want to ask is, how did he get such power as a young man? Who was he? How can anyone, just as a young man, start doing all these things? What were his contacts with the temple authorities? What were his contacts with the Roman authorities? How did he get such um, such uh, influence? How come he was sent to Damascus with letters, supposedly? If he was sent with letters to Damascus. Why would the high priest entrust anything to Paul <coughs> or Saul? These are questions we'll leave in advance. Well, Philip is now introduced, and uh, he goes to Samaria. And so now we're going to get the confrontation with Simon Magus. Why is Philip introduced here? Philip is going to have the first confrontation with Simon Magus. Philip will appear again in the um, once more after this episode when um, Paul goes to Caesarea right before the Jerusalem Council in chapter 21. And there it turns out he's living in Caesarea and he has um, Four virgin daughters who are prophetesses. We'll hit that one later on when we get to it. But um, at the moment, this is basically all we have about Philip. This and his conversion of the Ethiopian queen's eunuch here. But a certain man, line nine, named Simon, had been using magical arts in the city before. Uh, what city? City of Samaria. Uh, Samaria is usually uh, an area. It also has a city sometimes called Samaria. It was uh, had previous names uh, before that in the Bible. But let's leave that as it may. So Simon Magus is presented as being in a city in Samaria. Now in the Pseudo-Clementines, uh, we never get him in Samaria. But Pseudo Clementine says that he was born in Samaria in a city called Gita. So the Pseudo Clementines have uh, precise information about Simon, that he's actually a Samaritan, and that he's a disciple of John the Baptist along with another person called Dositheus. I can put that on the board here for you. So both Simon Magus, so this is much more precise information, again, to my mind, than what we have here, and Dositheus are two students of John the Baptist, and the pseudo Clementines also know John's, John's doctrine, I mean, Simon's doctrine, which is very much this primal Adam thing I've been uh, telling you about that keeps you popping up everywhere, and the standing one, and so on. It's in those things I gave you from the pseudo Clementines. You can read it if you, if you want. Uh, but the pseudo Clementines is not the only one who knows this. Other church fathers know this. I think Iranius knows this. Irenaeus, rather, and uh, one or two others, I think even in Eusebius, has picked it up from them when he comes to talk about these things, that he knows that Simon Magus is born in a city in Samaria called Gita. So they know, and then Simon Magus comes from Samaria. The confrontations don't occur in Samaria. Now, the closest city to Samaria on the seacoast is this seaport called Caesarea, named after Caesar by Herod who found it. So here we go. So there's a problem. 
Everyone was listening to him. He, uh, again, we have this description. He thought himself to be great the same way that um, Gamaliel was pre presented as talking about Judas the Galilean and Theudas. And he talks about the power of God, and that's true. This great power and so on is in the pseudo-Clementines as part of Simon's doctrine. And also other people who continue in about this teacher that we we'll, may hear about at some point called el Kazai, And that's Aramaic for the great power. Have this idea of the power and so on, which is something you should keep an eye on, this idea of the power. Again, if you read the Civil Confidence, you'll get more information about that. And he also knew magical arts. And Philip was preaching the kingdom. Simon was also a believer, too, and was baptizing people. So you see, again, all these disciples of John the Baptist, basically. And the apostles heard that Samaria was receiving the word of God. They sent Peter and John, again, Peter and John, no James, to join them. And they laid hands on people. And they received the Holy Spirit, line 18. And when Simon saw the Holy Spirit was given them by laying on hands, he offered them money. Give me the power. So again, the power vocabulary. And now it's an issue of money. Uh, something to do with money is the problem between them. And Peter says, may your money be destroyed. Something of the Judas Iscariot situation we heard earlier about the ill-gotten money. You shouldn't have any share in these things. Repent of your wickedness. And Simon, line 24, answers that. And that's it. And that's it. That's the end of the Simon Magazine. We don't know what happens, where he goes, what the outcome is, whether he started being a Christian, whether he didn't be a Christian, or anything. That's it. That's six of uh, uh, ten lines in Acts. The pseudo Clementines is a whole novel about this that goes on for about 150 pages. So there's something much more that is beneath the surface here. I don't know what it's all about. Simon goes to Rome, Peter goes to Rome, they have confrontations there. I, I don't know the whole thing, but this is <coughs> clearly a very superficial presentation of the issue. And not very depth, and again, dismissive. When would this be written? Now, this is written much later on. I don't, can't see this written before 100 A.D. or so. Like I said, it's just a surmise. I mean, this is information that's already been digested and, you know, basically thrown away as uh, insignificant. Well, we f now follow uh, uh, um, Philip preaching in the Samaritans. I don't know if the Samaritans ever were converted this time to Christianity. I have no idea. But anyway, Philip has an angel speak to him, line 26. And he says, go towards Gaza. He goes to Gaza, but he never gets there. In the end, he gets to Caesarea. Well, Caesarea is the closest place to Samaria. Why didn't he just go straight to Caesarea? Gaza is the gateway, as we now all know, to Egypt. It's on the way to Egypt. And I, I'm going to try to uh, go into this a little further next time. But let's just finish how it's presented here, then we'll go home. And, he, and as he went, he came to an Ethiopian, a eunuch, someone in control of a woman called Kandakis in the Greek, Candace in English, the queen of the Ethiopians. And he was her treasurer, and he had come to Jerusalem to, to worship. And, and he was sitting in the back of his chariot reading the prophet Isaiah. And uh, the Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go, go, jump, jump up on the back of the chariot. And running up to him, Philip heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he says, Do you know what you are reading? And uh, he said to Philip to come and sit down. And uh, he was reading from Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. And he was led by, uh, to the slaughter and uh, so on and so forth. And he did not speak, etc., etc., etc. And uh, why does the prophet say this, 34? Philip opened his mouth and began to preach. And then they passed some water. And then Philip said, uh, what keeps you from being baptized? If you believe from your whole heart, you will be baptized. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they went down to the water, and the eunuch was baptized. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away. 
again, this is quite a fantastic episode. I think you will admit again that this is not a very uh, normal history here, that Philip disappears. And the eunuch never saw him again, and he went away rejoicing. And Philip was found at Azotus, which is somewhere south of present-day Tel Aviv. And then he preached the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Well, I don't think a lot of cities along the coast there, but anyway, he came to Caesarea, but he was going to Gaza. Well, he never got to Gaza, apparently. Uh, in any event, you have to look at the map. We'll do that next time. But what I think we have here is the conversion of Queen Helen's son that we've already met in Eusebius and Josephus. And the key thing, I think, is the idea of eunuch. That is, they were reading the scripture, and a teacher came to them and asked them, do you know the meaning of what you are reading? And the scripture they were reading was Genesis 17, about how Abraham circumcised all the people in his, in his uh, party, in his community, including his household people, sons, and everything after he got the promises from God. And then they immediately went out and had themselves circumcised. Now, I'm not saying that anyone should do that. What I'm trying to say is that that episode is in Josephus, and it's in the Talmud, and it's in Eusebius. And um, I think this is the opposite side of the coin to that episode, and we'll see why. <coughs> that being a eunuch is how the Romans thought of circumcision. <coughs> and uh, I can explain why Philip is on his uh, way to Gaza, because Helen sent her famine relief agents to Egypt to buy grain and they were carrying all her money into Palestine and they were going to relieve the famine that we heard about in Eusebius. Anyway, we'll pick up next time about that but I think that the two episodes are parallel. We'll be able to talk about that a little bit next time and then we'll go on about how Peter gets his tablecloth vision in, um, in Jaffa uh, after he meets the Roman centurion. Thanks.